most of you have probably seen a little bit about what data binding is already. Uh, most of you have used data binding in, in different contexts. Uh, I'm here to talk about how to customize your data stuff. So we're going to go for about 45 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and if you have any questions, as Alejandro said, there's an ask a question button there on, on the bottom. So please use that. I'll answer any questions after the presentation. Uh, if you have any other comments, such as my video is cutting out or audio is bad or something, then just please let me know in the chat. I have it open here as well. Uh, so I'll try to react to that as soon as possible. But yeah, without further ado, welcome everybody and let's get started. So custom fields, let's start with that. How to use your data types with Binder. So Bodin of course has a lot of built-in custom or built-in fields, uh, components that mo manipulate data. You have your basic text fields or uh, checkboxes or selects or what have you, but those do operate only on specific data. The text field, for instance, operates on string types. Uh, integer field works on integers. Uh, the select you can customize, so you select one of your own data types, but what if you actually want to modify your own data type? How does that work? Well, for that we have custom field. Uh, Custom field is a class that's part of the Vaadin core package. Uh, that's basically uh, a base class for you to extend upon when you're building a customized field component. Uh, a few use cases. So if you want to support an unusual or non-standard data type, uh, we recently uh, came out with uh, like a big integer field for Vaadin, but before that, for instance, we didn't support big integers as field values, so you had to do that yourself. And the way you would do that is with a custom field. Uh, also, uh, creating a custom field gives you great encapsulation. So if you want to share your code with another project or just another view, then you just like code the component once and then you're good to go. You don't have to repeat those conversions of value all over your code base. So it's a very, uh, very, very convenient thing. So here's an example, like if you have a name field, then yeah, sure, you use a text field and that has a type of string, that's fine. Uh, but what if you have an avatar image? That's a byte array. What field do you use? Like upload? No, nope, that doesn't actually work because that's not a has value. And also you need, some things like mime type and file name. Text field doesn't really work either. Well, of course, if you speak fluent base 64, then maybe, but you understand my point. There's no built in field for byte arrays. So let's make one. Uh, custom fields can be any sort of Vaadin components. They can be web components or they can just be server side composites, which I'm going to do here just uh, for simplicity, uh, but it doesn't really matter. You can implement your custom field in any way you like. There are exactly two methods that you need to implement, and I'm gonna show you them very soon. So after you've created your custom field, you can use it as I do here. So you just have your avatar data type, which uh, I'll show you as well. And then you create an avatar field, and then you use the avatar field in the binder. Simple as that. So yeah, first of all, choose data type. When you create a custom field, you need to know what data you're gonna uh, use with the, with the field. So in my case, I want to represent an avatar image uh, that internally has three data fields. There's a byte array, and there's also strings for name and mime type. So it's, it's pretty easy, but this can be as complex as you want, and this can be pretty much any Java class. This is all run on the server side, so there's pretty much no limitations on what the data type can be and how complex it is. So how do we actually start building the custom field? Well, the one and only 
reason for a custom field to exist is to handle a custom value. So let's start with that and then we'll add some uh, niceties um, on the on the rest of the or during the rest of the presentation. So we'll have to store the value. And the easiest way is just to store it as a class field here. So you can see we have a private avatar image value just as a class field in our avatar field class that extends custom field with the type avatar image. Now the avatar image is, as I showed you, the just normal Bojo data class type. Then we have two methods, getting the value and setting the value. For custom fields, they're called generate model value and then set presentation value. And as you can see, very easy to implement here. Generate model value is called by the framework whenever the framework needs the current value. Typically when storing the bean, like calling binder.commit, or when calling just get value on this field. So we return the value, simple as that. The other method, set presentation value, is when the framework wants to update the value. So basically calling uh, dot set value on this field or binding it through a binder. Here, we take the new value, new presentation value, and then just store it overriding whatever we had there. And then we also call an update visuals method on, I'm gonna show you. Basically meaning that if someone else changed the value of this method, update the visuals so that the user can see that the value changed. And that's it. That's honestly, that's everything a custom field needs to do by contract. It doesn't need to do anything else. So we can use this code with the binder and it will work fully. Of course, you can't see anything, but you know, let's do that next. So showing the value. Uh, since this is an avatar image, let's just make it simple. Use an IMG tag to show the current value if there is any to the user. So we have an image component that we create here, set a max height to it just to make sure that it doesn't blow up any layouting that we have. Uh, hide it by default just to make sure that uh, we don't, or that if there's no image to show, then we don't uh, add it to the DOM structure. Uh, I'll show you a live demo about this and, and all the other things later. So you'll see, see what I mean with this. But that's it, just show an image there or add the image component. And then uh, we'll use a stream resource to dynamically serve a value to the image component if we have a value in the field. So the update visuals method that was called earlier looks like this. So if value is uh, not null and if we actually have image, so we have a byte data there, then we set the source for the current avatar component, which is an image. And stream resources are uh, an easy way to serve dynamic content from your Java code, basically taking in the byte array and then serving it uh, to the client. And if there's no value, then just uh, clear the source and uh, set the visibility to false. Just niceties for the user so that they, they see that, okay, there's no value here right now. Updating the value, uh, an upload of some sort is of course pretty obvious here. Uh, upload also allows the user to take new pictures. If you're using a, a mobile device, then the upload component should allow you to just for the user to use a camera and add a new uh, image that way, which is nice, of course. Uh, so set up the upload. It's slightly more complicated than the image component because you'll need to add uh, some listeners for users to start uploading if it uh, upload success, so when it's done, uh, if some error happens, and for instance here, I restrict the upload type to images and also to maximum one megabyte of size, just in case. Uh, if you don't unrestrict, or if you don't restrict the max file size, then the user might try to upload a terabyte big image and uh, 
if your server isn't configured for that, then you're going to have a bad time. So just as a precaution, we're limiting the size here. So that's it. We show the value and we let the user upload the value. Of course, we need to add both of these. Uh, the last line here, add, add upload, we'll add both of the components to our avatar field. The last method here is uh, the receive upload. So what happens when uh, the actual upload is successful? Uh, we clear any errors and then we just store the byte array basically. And then we have a new value in the field. Uh, all of this code is going to be available for you later on. So you don't need to do screenshots or anything like that. Uh, uh, we're going to distribute this or you can actually get it from volume.com slash start already if, if you want to. So yeah, upload success. Uh, when we actually have the new value, just call set model value. That's the key thing here. So whenever you change the value, you want to let the framework know that you changed the value. So you call set model value and then update the image uh, at the end. So yeah, let's do a live demo. I have the project here that you can run as well. I'm just going to start it real quick. I didn't have it running because it takes up a lot of processing power and I need everything for this presentation actually to run apparently. It's not very optimized. Otherwise, yeah, it looks pretty good, this software that we're using. But all right, uh, we have our app running. So we have a sign up form. This is the form example app from vadin.com slash start. No modifications, no nothing. And you can see the avatar field here. So the avatar field is a part of that package. So you can take a look at the code from there. So we have our upload and there is an image component here as well. But since the uh, value is empty or it's null, we don't see anything. So let's try it out. Let's upload a file. Let's choose a suitably bad picture. The file is too big, an error message. Oh no. So I tried to upload a file that's more than one megabyte in size. So it doesn't uh, allow it to complete. There's an error and the error handling here is taking care of showing a message. But if I try the other one that I prepared earlier, it's smaller. So it, it works fine. And as you can see, we actually show the image here and we still allow the user to change it afterwards. But a very, very simple custom component. And when I click join the community, then the binder that's behind all of this will just use the avatar image as any other and store my avatar image, compo uh, my avatar image data, just the normal POJO uh, as it would any other data type. And of course, I can use this avatar image or avatar field anywhere else in my application or in other applications by just copying the code or publish it on the directory for other people to enjoy. But yeah, pretty much as simple as that. There's two methods that you need to implement and you need to store the value somehow. Other than that, the framework doesn't really care. Just Think about how would the user like to modify this data. It can be in a text field. It can be in 10 text fields. It can be an upload component or a grid or a select. Uh, the more important thing is how does the user interact with your component? Creating the actual data binding stuff is pretty easy. So let's get back to the presentation. I'm gonna make it full screen as well. There we go. So what's missing here? So we we store the value, we show the current value, and we let the users update the value. So what else do we actually need? Well, there are a couple of things that you can add, but that are optional. The framework doesn't force you to implement these, but of course, many of them are useful to have. Things such as error handling, events, like custom events, uh, validators, and then the read only required and is enabled features. So let's go through them and see uh, 
what or how we can implement each of these into our custom component if we want if we want the feature to be available. Error handling, you already saw that. When I tried to upload an, an image that was too big, it failed and we got uh, the error handling here. There is a set invalid and set error message method already in custom field that you can use for this exact purpose. So previously in the code, uh, I had uh, upload failed listener on the upload component, which mean, means that if the upload fails for any reason, then call this listener. And in that listener, I simply call this method here, set failed. This is my own private method that I created in my component. And the only thing it does is it sets the uh, status of the component to invalid, and then it sets the error message to whatever message I want. And that's it. When uh, the component is invalid, then the binder knows it's invalid. It doesn't let the commit go through. And it also uh, shows it visually with the built-in styles that Vaadin has, uh, that something is wrong for the user so they can see it. And yeah, simple as that. Of course, you can customize any of this if you want. You can override the set invalid and set error message uh, components or the uh, methods, sorry. Or you can just create your own error message labels or show notifications or confirm dialogues or whatever. What else? Events. So the value change event of Vaadin fields is the one that you're going to be used or the one that you're going to use most of the time, right? It's, it's the basic stuff. Whenever the value changes, notify me. That's already present in the custom field super class. So when you're extending from custom field, you get that built in. You don't need to implement any sort of listeners or, uh, or event classes yourself. If you, however, want to do a custom thing, uh, so for instance, uh, if you want to have an avatar upload listener uh, class that you can then use from your Java code somewhere or or uh, some other sort of event on the client side uh, that you want to be able to react to on the server, then this is how you do it. Uh, you create a listener class and an event class, and then you use the built-in methods that custom field gives you. Uh, add listener and then fire event. So to register a new listener, just call add listener. And then when you want to fire that event, you just call fire event with whatever event type that you want. So adding these two methods to your custom field will allow you to use custom events uh, in your component. What about validators then? Well, since we have binder, we've moved the validation features away from the component and into the binder. And all fields that uh, work with the field or the has value API that we have in the framework automatically work with validators as well. So there's actually nothing you need to do. This field already works with validators. The only thing you have to do is make sure that the validator that you're using uses the same data type. So it has to operate on avatar image uh, values, but that should be pretty clear to anyone. Same as uh, string validators operate on text fields, then we need a validator that operates on the correct data type. But adding validators, yeah, you can just do that to the binder already. No extra code needed. What about these then? Read only, required and enabled. Uh, all of these are features that the built-in Vaadin components have and which are convenient for any developers to use when they're creating forms and UIs in general. Uh, here's where things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, all Vaadin components are web components. That's how they're implemented. So they don't really have like Java logic to control this behavior, like graying out stuff or not accepting inputs. That's all, all of that happens on the client side. Uh, however, uh, there is something that the framework does do. So it does, it only set, uh, what the framework does is it 
sets a property on the client side for uh, in the HTML tag. That's what the implementation does. So for instance, set read only, what it does is basically is it calls uh, set attribute or set property. Now I can't remember. Uh, one of those two on the element, which means that on the client side, uh, things will happen. If you want to support these, then you'll have to do them yourself. Uh, if you're using a composite component like we're using here, we have our custom field, but the custom field is using an image and an upload. Then this is pretty easy. We can just override the method. So saying instead of setting this property on client side where we know it's not going to do anything because we don't have client side code in this component. Instead, just use the built-in stuff from upload, which is already there. So we're rerouting the events basically to the real components that we're using. This can be done, of course, with any built-in uh, Baden component. So text fields and selects and whatever, all of those support read-only required and enabled. So you can just uh, reroute the events to any of the components that you need, basing, uh, based, of course, on how you want your own field to behave. So read-only might look different from a non-read-only mode, but that's up to you to decide how to do. Then the final thing, when you're doing components, uh, you have to think about sizing. So what happens if a developer calls avatar field dot set dot set size full? That's a good question. What expands and what doesn't? That's something that you need to think about when you're creating your, your component. As said, this is an optional feature. You don't have to do that. In, and in fact, the avatar field in the code doesn't actually do anything with sizing. That's because the default sizes are OK for this particular example. Uh, but I will know for a fact if you call set size full on it, then things will look pretty interesting. So if you want to try it out, then that's something that I recommend you, you do a little bit. Uh, so call set size full, see what happens, and then see what you can do to change uh, the behavior. And in this case, it's pretty easy. We only have two subcomponents. So the height and width of the components need to change. So is it the image preview that should expand? Is it the upload? Uh, or is it not, neither of those things? Do you simply not support set size full and override the methods to do nothing? That's, that's your choice. Uh, just know that if you're creating a custom component of any sort, then sizing is something that you will need to think about a little bit. And uh, it's not tricky. It's just thinking about the different options that you have. Okay, if, if the height is full, do this. If the width is full, do this and, and so forth. The defaults of body components are already pretty good. So uh, there's not a lot of thing, a lot of stuff that you need to think about typically. And sometimes you can just leave it completely. If you know that it's just going to be used in a form, and it's fine, just leave it. It doesn't really matter. It's going to be fine. So yeah, as I said, the code is available on wadin.com slash start, the form example. You'll have to scroll down a little bit to find it there. Uh, it's also available on GitHub, of course, at the URL there. We'll share these links afterwards so that you can you can find them easily as well. But yeah, that's custom components in a very, very small nutshell uh, in like 20 minutes or so. Uh, of course, there's other things that you could do. But as I said, all of those are optional. The only things you have to do is the value manipulation. Uh, and that stuff is very easy. And also these other things are easy as well. It's just a, a little bit of thinking that you have to do where to reroute uh, your your events. And yeah, uh, good point there. Uh, we're also recording these presentations and they will be available on YouTube uh, after some time. So you can check up on these as well. But yeah, that's custom fields. There's another thing with, with custom data binding. Uh, of course, yeah, you're gonna need your own image to test with. So bear that in mind. 
The other thing that we're going to work with is custom data providers. So one thing is, yeah, you have a custom field for your custom data type in a form. But then what if you want to customize the list of items that you send to a grid, for instance? Like collections are, yeah, the they're very easy to use and they work well and they're super convenient. If you just have, let's say, 10 to 50 items in, in a grid or select, then just yeah, use a collection. Absolutely. Well, don't don't worry about anything else. It's gonna be fine. But at some point, it's not gonna work anymore. The reason why you would like to customize the data for a grid in particular, is that at some point, you're going to realize that you have so much data in that particular piece of the application that it doesn't make sense to load it all for the user. The user is probably never going to scroll through all of the data. And you're just going to be using memory on the server without any benefits. So the in-memory data pro providers, the basic stuff uh, like set items, uh, creating data providers of a collection, all of that stores all of the data in server memory between round trips. So whatever you load into a data pro provider will be in memory until you don't use that data provider anymore. And as I said, it works well in the beginning until it doesn't. And all applications have examples of this. The data set will grow over the lifetime of the app. And at some point, you're going to realize that you don't have 100 rows anymore. You have thousands or tens of thousands, millions. And at that point, you should not be uh, loading that stuff into server memory anymore. So what can be done? Well. There's a couple of things we can do, but the easiest way is just to use a lazy data provider. Uh, a lazy data provider is something that you create uh, and you have to implement two methods. The two methods are called by whichever component is using the data provider. So say a grid or a combo box. Uh, the grid automatically knows or it knows internally that which rows are visible to the user right now. And then it calls the method saying, hey, these methods should be visible or these rows should be visible to the user. Could you please give them to me? But don't worry about the rest of it. And then you provide those rows. Let's say rows from zero to 50, the initial set when the page loads. And then the user scrolls down a little bit and the grid says, hey, now the user is seeing rows 200 to 250. I don't have data for that. So let's ask the data provider. And then you reply with, very well, here's the data from index 200 to 250. And that way, regardless of how many rows you have in your database, it's going to be millions. We've tested this on millions of rows. The grid is always as fast. It always only has the amount that the user can see in memory, the amount of data, let's say 50 to 100 rows, and nothing more. Everything else is discarded, and the memory usage is only for that data that is visible uh, to the user. Of course, this is a little bit trickier than just a custom field, because we at Vaadin, don't know how your backend works. We we just we can't make even educated guesses because there's just so many different ways of doing things. You might be calling REST services, or you might be using JPA with Hibernate, or you just might want to automate everything and use like a Spring Data Provider, uh, a data repository, sorry, or you can use a graph database, or you can use a file system, or whatever. We, we just can't know. So we will, in this case, we have to give the control over to you. We provide the framework and the queries, and then we expect 
you as the expert of your application to give us the correct data. So let's see how this works a little bit deeper. Uh, these are the two methods that a lazy data provider uses. So fetch the data and then fetch the count. You create a data provider like this. We give you a query data object and you have two methods that return the data that we request. The query data object uh, has all the stuff that you need to know what data you should provide, such as the start index and the end index, or actually it's not the end index, it's how many uh, items you should provide. And then also information about if the data should be filtered. For instance, a combo box has built-in filtering, so we support that, of course. And then also sorting. So if the user has sorted the data in a grid, for instance, we give you that information so that you can sort the data that you provide back. So here's a very, very, very simple implementation. Uh, this is from the REST example application on vadin.com slash start. Uh, and it uses a, a REST API to fetch the data. Uh, for a lazy provider. So let's start with the count method because that's easier. The count method should return how many items are in the full data set. So basically, if you have a row with a million or a database with a million rows and you want to show those, then your count method should return a million without any filtering applied, of course. Uh, if you have a thousand, then you should return a thousand. In this case, we ask the REST API, please give us the integer of how many rows you have. And that's it. Then the fetch data, which actually should return the, the rows of data, slightly more complicated, but not too much. So here again, we're using the same REST API to actually fetch the data. Uh, the REST has a count and an offset. So it's a paging REST provider, which we're, we're going to need. So we take the count and offset that we got from the query uh, data object from the lazy data provider. We check, OK, you want this many items starting from index this. OK, and then we fetch those from REST and provide those back uh, to the grid. Sorting. Uh, most data that you have is sorted by default. Like if you put items into, into a combo box and you use a collection, you sort the collection before you put it to the combo box typically, and then you don't worry about it. Uh, things become more complicated when you have a grid where the user can uh, sort stuff by themselves. So they can choose that I want to sort on this column or this column. Uh, and since that's dynamic, we can't again give you much help with the actual sorting operations. But what we can do, of course, is, is give you what uh, the requested sort order was. So which column is currently marked as sort by and in which order uh, should the sorting be done. And that can be found from the query data object as well, called Q here in this slide, just for brevity. So from the same object, we get the limit and the offset data. We also get sort orders. And sort orders is basically a list of uh, stuff that says, in this order, please sort the data, uh, either ascending or descending. So for this sort of provider, uh, in our fetch data method, we need to provide sorting somehow. Now, you don't have to implement sorting. You can uh, disable sorting on your grid, for instance, if you want to, that's fine. And then you don't need to implement any of, any of the sorting stuff. 
uh, but it is very good for the user. Uh, most users would like to sort data in a table somehow. So typically you will need to implement this sooner or later anyway. But uh, the API is very straightforward. We give you a list of query sort order objects and it, each query sort order object has two things. It has which column was uh, did the user select for sorting and in which direction uh, should this data be sorted. And then you use that data to apply sorting uh, in your queries, for instance, to the database as in this example. So we'll add order by clause, clauses to our queries if sorting is enabled. Filtering is similar to sorting in that you don't have to do it. And in fact, for grid even, there is no built-in filter controls. So if you just use the pure grid, then uh, the user can't filter the data in any way. The combo box, however, does have a built-in sorting. And if you want the combo box uh, sort uh, filtering to work properly, then you'll have to implement it as well, uh, the filtering part of the data provider. The API is very, very similar to sorting in that uh, you get the stuff that you need, the filter object, for instance, a string uh, from the query data object. So uh, the query data uh, has both sorting and filtering objects for you. If no filtering is applied, then the, the filtering object is null and you don't need to worry about it. But if there is a filtering string, for instance, there, then it's your responsibility to include that in your query as well. Such as here in SQL, we just add the where clause to our SQL in, in the case we have a filter. Of course, filtering can be more complicated than that, especially if you're using multiple keywords. Again, we from Vaadin can't know what your data is look, looking like and how it should be filtered. So that's unfortunately up to you to implement. But we do provide the tools uh, so that it works in the grid and the combo box. So here's basically how that works. Similar to uh, sorting, the filter is in the query data object. So you just pass that along to your service method or wherever you get the data from. Note that the sort method only needs to be applied in fetch data because of course the count method here doesn't care about sorting. The amount of items is gonna be the same. But filtering is different. Uh, filtering for data providers means that you are restricting the set of uh, full objects or full rows to a subset based on the filter. And that means that the count of rows changes as well. So if you apply filtering, you need to apply filtering to both the fetch data and the fetch count methods. This is just so that the grid knows that, okay, this is the amount of data now, this is how the scroll bars are gonna look. So let's not, uh, show the user that there's more data than, than there actually is and making sure the indexes and everything go correctly. So just remember uh, sorting is for the data method only and filtering is for the data and the count methods. Of course, the Java docs tell you this as well. So for combo box, uh, it has built-in filtering and the filter type is a string. So that's quite easy. You get a string as a filter and then you use that. Uh, the grid is more complicated though, because in grid, the way you filter things is not straightforward because there might be multiple columns uh, that you want to filter on. You want might want to filter on just one of them at a time or multiple. So. Here, we're gonna need a little bit of more, uh, more control and a bit more code to control filtering programmatically in the data provider. So let's take a very close uh, or a shorter look on how that works. Uh, 
I have a very simple search filters class here, which has three properties. It has a filter string, it has a created by user, and it has a minimum total amount. Uh, if you, for instance, want to filter invoices, then this is something that you might want to filter by. You have a string ju that just does normal string filtering, but also just restrict the users that are uh, that created the invoice, and then just total amount might be something that the user might want to filter by. Then you'll need to create these filters and add them to the UI somehow so that the user can actually uh, use your filtering controls. And then we get to the interesting part. How do you connect those fields with the data provider? Well, first of all, when you're creating the data provider, you'll have to call an additional method, which is this with configurable filter. Basically what it does is it adds uh, a set filter method to the data provider, adding you to on demand change the filtering from Java code. So the combo box just uses strings and the strings are uh, given to you by the component itself. You don't need to worry about it, but the grid, since it doesn't have built-in filters, you'll have to tell the grid when to do the filtering. Typically a button press or a value change or something will call the method. But this with configurable filter here is, is the important part. So yeah provider.setFilter. And here we just create a new search filters object and get the value from the fields that are uh, populated at that point. And then of course, remember that both the fetch data and fetch count uh, methods need to actually take this filter into account. So this fetch count method as an example here takes in the filters object. It's an optional. Uh, so if it's present, add the where clause to the appropriate queries, uh, just to make sure that your data is filtered correctly. But that's pretty much it. Uh, filtering here, you have a, a configurable filter data provider. The API is very verbose here, so it takes up the full screen. It's not actually that complicated. It might just look a little bit intimidating, but it's it's not actually that hard once you take a take a closer look. So you create the data provider just normally having uh, the two uh, fetch methods, fetching data, fetching the count, and then you add the with configurable filter. And that gives you a, the additional API method of providing the filter yourself whenever you want to. And then the data provider and grid take care of things for you after that. So you just update the filter. You can set it to null to clear all fil uh, clear the filtering or set it to some sort of filter. And then the grid will update itself accordingly and fetch data from the back end accordingly where, where the user scrolls and everything. So that works works fine. So yeah. As I said, you can get this code from uh, body.com slash start as well. It's available on GitHub uh, as, are, is, uh, as are all of our examples. Uh, but yeah, this one doesn't need an image, but of course you can add one if you want to. Uh, other than that, running out of time. So let's do a very quick recap. Why would you use custom field when there's so many built-in fields with Vaadin? Well, the normal reason is you need a custom data type. The types that we provide fields for is just not, it's the basic stuff that you would expect, strings, integers, and so forth. We don't have your data types. If And if you want to edit an invoice amount or something, then uh, the way to do that is by a custom field. Uh, and the custom field pro provides you with great encapsulation, for instance, and reusability. After you've created a component once, you can use it anywhere. So a very, very handy tool. Custom data providers. You will want to use them. It's as simple as that. Any app will want to use custom data providers at one point or another. Like uh, when you create the app, you might only have a couple of hundred or thousand test rows and it's going to be fine. But in production, sooner or later, you will run into the issue where your database has grown 
to tens of thousands of rows and it's not going to be fast or memory efficient anymore to load all of that into server memory and that's when you want data providers so yeah that's it for me uh, thanks very much for following me with along this first session uh, so we have 10 minutes for questions now uh, if you haven't asked them quickly go down to the bottom there there's a ask a question thing and let's see what people have asked and if i can answer uh, answered them sufficiently well. So, uh, question number one here. Oh, nope, wait. Ah, oh, okay, it's the other way around. Let's start with that one. Uh, can you say anything about the data provider rework, which would, this is jumping all over the place. A data provider rework, which should support seek pagination and unknown size. I can. Haijan is going to talk about that a little bit later on, I think, but it is in the works. It's not uh, fully done yet, but we're expecting uh, the first release, the betas to come out during the fall. And yeah, that, that will have an improved API uh, and also um, improved handling of the set size or the getting the size of the container. Um, the data provider uses two backend calls uh, when getting the uh, when changing the filter or the sort order. So yes, there's two. There's one for count and one for data. Uh, how should we use the data provider if a single backend call returns both the number of records and the requested data? Uh, you're going to have to either cache the size of, of the data and then just provide that separately, or you're going to have to rework your backend to support these two methods. So lazy data providers only work uh, if your backend supports paginated uh, queries. So giving the the start index and the amount of data that you want. Uh, the separate size query uh, is going to go away or we're going to have support for data sets that don't have that uh, later this year. It's not there yet, but it will be there uh, later this year. Um, a question about component value change events. Um, you fire a component value change event after the set value. I'm sorry, Alessandro, I don't know out of hand uh, about your question. I'd, I'd have to see the code and, and the output. I can't answer that immediately. Sorry. Uh, there's also an add filter method that doesn't replace given filters, but rather expands them. Uh, yeah, so a lot of Vaadin APIs have this duality of set filter and add filter or uh, set validator and add. No, that's not true. But uh, for filters, at least there's set and add. So yes, add adds another one without clearing the previous ones and then set replaces everything that you've done so far with the new one. Uh, are there substantial issues about lazy providers applied on tree grid recursive data providers? Uh, I'm not aware of any substantial issues regarding lazy providers with tree grid, so hierarchical data providers. Uh, hierarchy, of course, adds some additional complexity because you always al also have to know when to uh, fetch the children of a specific item, but there's uh, the API, of course, fully supports this, and the API is slightly more complicated than what I showed you here, but I'm not aware of any issues. Uh, the data provider sample on body.com slash start uh, is the REST example. So it's not the data provider example per se, but it's the REST provider example. Uh, it has uh, more examples than just what I showed you. And the primary reason for the example application is to uh, 
demonstrate how to call third-party REST APIs from your Vardin app. But in doing so, it also shows you all the different ways in which you can use data providers in a Vardin application, in a, like a real-world uh, situation. Does the framework make the fetch data call if the fetch count return was zero? That's a good question. I do not know. I'm not sure. Should be pretty easy to test though. I just haven't thought about it. But yeah, that's it for me.